Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? We thank you so much for joining us on another live porch talk. Yeah. Yes. We hope that you had um, a great Christmas and a good new year. And we are excited today because we have a very special guest. How did you um, do in your New Year's and Christmas? Did you have a good Christmas this year? I did. It yeah. was really wonderful. Yeah. A lot of finally some rest. Yes. <laughs> oh, for you is a busy month. Yeah. You know, Kim's a worship leader, so she gets called uh, to action. <laughs> she's joining many, many assignments. And so um, we are, we did have our time of rest, right? But okay. we're ready for the new year and God's got new assignments for us. And um, our last porch talk was amazing. We ended the year with Cheryl and um, the kids and her testimony of the children that she's adopted and Daniel and Katie and Israel. So we thank them so much for being on. But today. Yes, today we are so honored yet to have. Juan Martinez, or Juan, yes, no, Juan Martinez. Juan Martinez. Yes. I went, yes, I went blank for a minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> good, good. Uh, yes, we are so excited about having Juan Martinez on this morning. And welcome to Porch Talk. Hey, let me tell you something, Kim and Danielle. I am so honored to be with you guys. Come on, I'm on Porch Talk. Yes. Yay! Hi. You. We're sporting you. We got our sweatshirt. Our get wrapped shirt. <laughs> Come on, man. I love that. You know the there's no place like home. I love what the sweater says, right? Because it's yes. seven. That should always be our our motto, right? Yes. Like that we're travelers through here. So that's right. Well, we were. We had such a good time when we came to your church last. Yes. Uh, I believe it was in October. Yeah. And um, you just really, really blew us away. You really inspired us, and wow. uh, we know that whole thing was a divine meeting. Come and we we've, we've just been really excited and anticipated um, just such an amazing porch talk today with you. Oh, yes. So much. I'm excited. I'm excited about these questions. You know, I. You know, <laughs> You prepare, you know, in the time of your presence with the Lord uh, for the goal to see captives free, to see blind eyes open, to see the lame walk, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm excited. Porch talk. Come on. <laughs> well, we are excited. So we kind of want to start at the beginning because you have an amazing testimony yeah. um, that led to writing your new book, which we'll talk about um, yeah. towards the end of our broadcast. But we would like to know a little bit about your childhood. Were you raised in church? And um, what was your childhood like? My childhood? Well, you know what? I have to say I, have, I had a great mom. You know, I'm going to also, I'm going to honor my dad too, you know, because I believe that most people do what they know. So, you know, if they don't know how to do it another way, then you really can't get mad at them because they don't really know. That's why Jesus is always, always saying, forgive them for they not know what they do. They parent it at the best of their ability. And so, um, you know what? As a child, at a young age, I, I feel like I was a good kid. But my dad and my mom, they got a divorce when I was about eight years old. And I believe that that was a, a determining factor in my life because um, I, I believe like a father, like when you look at a heavenly father, you know, he doesn't crush your spirit, but he breaks your will, your desire. You know, when I want to do this, he breaks that will. And me not having that, my mom did the best that she could. So I gravitated with that void to everything that was around me. So I'm watching movies that seemed real because if, you know, they say, well, Scarface is a, you know, it's a, they say it's based on true events or whatever, or fictitious thing. But the reality is this, that when I saw that movie, I also heard that in music. And then I also went outside and saw it. So that was the truth for me. That was real for me, you know? And eventually as a kid, my mom gets remarried years later and they, you know, her, my stepfather at the time who he passed away from cancer, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at a young age. Um, and the, he, they opened up bars and all that. And I just started gravitating to that scene. And at about the age of 13, 
I, I started uh, testing out drugs and all that. 14, I'm, I'm selling drugs already and everything. I'm selling to grownups. And I always tell people, what was crazier? Uh, the young guy selling to the grownups or the grownups buying from the young guy? <laughs> you, you know, it was just this wild road and it never stopped. I, I had a thirst of lust and nothing was ever enough. And I guess all my friends didn't, well, some did have dads, but most of my friends didn't have dads either. So we were all a bunch of guys with voids who did not understand how to fulfill uh, a purpose plan, any of that. We just had dreams and we picked the dreams out of television and radio. Wow. wow. Yeah. So, so were you, uh, were you raised in church? Oh, absolutely. So here's the thing. You know, the Bible, I believe, has this theme that uh, obviously it's God trying to redeem his children uh, back to him, reconcile them back to the father. Right. But I feel like it also has this theme of have a relationship with me. Um, there's some who have a form that look like they have a relationship. And then there's the one who truly have a relationship. Well, at that moment, I don't even think I understood the word relationship as most people I believe don't um, because depending upon their atmospheres or what they've been through in life, um, they might have a distorted view of relationship. And so when you say have a relationship with Jesus, they don't really, they have a relationship based upon the ideology of whatever it was that they think a relationship was. So for me, when I went to church, it was more about, uh, it's going to sound funny, but I, you know, I, I would go to church and it was like, boom, check. I went to church with my mom and whom my dad really at that time at a young age, I remember her go in there and tell your dad to go to church. So he didn't really have a relationship and he didn't care. So somewhere in my subconscious, I probably thought, why should I care? You know, and so I would go check the box. I would get really excited about drinking a little bit of the wine. Maybe that should have been a sign of where I was headed. <laughs> and me, but um, that was it. It was more like I went to church. What a drag! Um, so I really didn't have a personal, intimate relationship with God. To me, God was far, far away. And I, you know, I joke around with people, and I go, "Man, the day I got saved, God must have been so happy because." <laughs> broken record every single time I pray. So let's say something happened, I will go into the Our Father who are in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, right? And Jesus, and then I wouldn't even say Jesus, I just say amen, right? And then something else would happen. Our Father. Right? So I never had to talk to my dad. But I, I always thought I was talking. Now that's my point about relationship. I always thought I was talking to my dad, right? Because I really didn't talk to my dad, if that makes any sense. So it always sounded the same. He's going to pick me up every other week. Maybe, maybe not. I'm hoping he hears me. That's the, oh, if you, when you look at that and you look at my relationship with the father, it's, it was exactly the same. <laughs> Think about yeah. it. And yeah. so I thought this was relationship. That's kind of what I did with God, right? Yeah. Said the same things all the time. It was very repetitive. You know, it was like, that was a relationship and then drop me off. Right. And then I go about my life. But, so, yeah, that was my picture of church life. Church, yeah. church was just go there because it was like insurance, right? Like, you know, if there's a hell, I go to church. So I believe I, I was selling drugs for 23 years and I thought I was getting into heaven, you know, so <laughs> you how off I was. Wow. And then when I was little, I used to make deals with God. Lord, if he if my parents still find out, I'll say ten Hail Marys and you know say the rosary ten times. You know. <laughs> um, so, what were the events that led up to your incarceration, and then how many years were you incarcerated? Ooh, so I've done about ten years of prison. Um, ten years of prison, and what uh, now? About 10 years of prison, this last one was four, and I was facing 25. So, um, obviously, my sit, you know, I always tell people when I go to jails, I go, Hey, here's the thing if you, I go, You think that when you're going to leave the door, you're going to be free. But the reality is that you were incarcerated before you got incarcerated. That's and good. 
reason why everybody's there. I go, the reason why y'all are all in the same place from different places was because you all thought the same and the way you think is what brings unity. Whether it's for evil or for uh, good, right? And so I was like, so for me, this last time, it was a couple of events that I, obviously I feel like my whole life was one event that God was trying to get me there. You know, whether I say I can start nitpicking and saying, well, Catholicism or whatever, but it did introduce me a little bit to there being a God. So that's good. And so, I mean, there was a Bible. I just didn't read it, but and nobody around me read it. So I really wasn't listening. And so I feel like that, you know, time later, I would almost I would get robbed and be at a near death experience. And um, I got beat for about 45 minutes in forward, Texas. I'm bleeding everywhere. My head's big. And I believe, to be honest, I believe that that's the first time I ever really cried out to God, even though I did not know what to do, Jesus, salvation. I didn't know any of that. I just knew that at that moment, I heard a clack of the gun. I thought I was going to die. And I started yelling, our father, who are in heaven. I mean, at the top of my lungs, right? And I didn't care because I'm going to die. And I did know that there was a hell. So just in case, I better yell out. Now, the crazy part is that he never pulls the trigger. He runs to the car. They robbed me for everything. It was a drug deal gone bad, I guess. The whole thing was bad. But, you know, in those times, it was a drug deal gone bad. And uh, you know what? I wind up, like, I guess for the first time ever crying out. But I didn't listen. After that, I went and got, because my thought patterns were still the same, so I winded up going right back to thinking what could numb my pain, right? Because I don't think addictions and all of that stuff, I think that's just the fruit of, of, of the root, you know? And uh, I, am, I, I just, after that, man, I started thinking, and I would go, and then another time, so this is the second phase where I'm sitting in the car, and, uh, you know, I could probably count in my hands from the age of, like, 22 to 36 how often i was sober so mm -hmm. that uh every day i was high every day and so this day i was sober as crazy as that sounds i was sober and i don't remember why i was sober. i know i was sober and uh i get in the car and um there's a driver i have a driver and all of a sudden they're driving and i'm looking at the clouds and as crazy as it sounds the clouds began to speak to me wow. I, I, it just felt impressed within my um my my spirit or something i didn't even know what to call it then you know i just started you know for those who have been baptized in the holy spirit you understand what i'm about to say but the crazy part was i don't know maybe the cry to the lord got me saved and i didn't have to do the walk to the altar and the raise my hand and the i didn't i, I just felt like maybe the cry to the lord got me there because that day i just it was like a faucet was opened and I just began crying uncontrollably, uncontrollably. It was kind of like a movie that we got a ton of meth in the trunk and in different places of the car. And she looks at me and she's like, are you okay? You know, she's like <laughs> crying, crying and crying. And I really felt within my spirit, why are you killing, stealing, and destroying the very lives I'm giving people? Now, I had never read the Bible, so I didn't know John 10.10. 10. You know, later I would figure out that it was God because it was scripture. And, and uh, he's like, you're turning great people into prostitutes, and you're breaking homes, and you're doing all of these things. And I'm just crying and crying and crying. I mean, for the first time in my life, I felt like I'm just horrible. And then in a twinkling of an eye, I just stopped crying. So either, wow. I, either I was losing my mind. I don't know. I, I look back and I'm like, there's no way. This was just intense. I mean, how do you go from just uncontrollably to like a, a just a, I'm telling you, like it was like turned off. And then, and then, you know, the girl that was seemed like, you you know, all of a sudden <laughs> normal. She's like, we're going to go to jail, you know? I think TV ended a story and they have a story that they kind of did the whole reenactment thing, you know, but I winded up um, like just like opening my eyes. And now I still delivered the drugs, but I was thinking you're destroying them. You're destroying them. But I still did not know how to change. The crazy part is, you know, in our first outreach, when I didn't know how to do anything, I just decided I was going to go back. And, do you know, Jonah got spit out of the mouth of the whale. I got spit out of the mouth of the jail. And I ran back to all the places 
I just thought as a Christian, you got to go back everywhere. You got to do what you got to do to let these people know. Well, 1,200 people showed up, and I think 300 people got saved, and I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just a guy with a Bible, right? And, uh, and um, the crazy part is that I say that because when that happened, I began to tell people, I think God's talking to me. I think God's talking to me. And they would all be like, you're tripping out. You're high. You know, what's wrong with you? What do you mean God's talking to you, you know? It's crazy that it sounds in that world. I guess everybody thought that, you know, I guess everybody thought knew God somewhat or heard of him because they were all like, you're crazy. What do you mean God's talking to you? That's how all those people showed up. Because when I showed up to say, I'm going to tell you what God, in their head, they're thinking, this dude wasn't lying. So I believe that was the second event. Now, I did not listen, but I had this little still small voice that I did not understand who it was. And uh, now all of a sudden I get I get I get blamed for something. I'm sitting somewhere. I was selling meth and selling drugs and all stuff from like Mesquite, Texas, uh, all the way to Dallas, all the way to Odessa. Every town in between from the little towns to the bigger towns. It was just crazy. And uh, it was a wild ride that I thought would be fun that I eventually wanted to get off on that hurt a lot of people and destroyed a lot of lives. And um, you know what? This final time, uh, this guy does a crime and they blame it on me. They all of a sudden, the, you know, it's kind of, you know, they know you when somehow they reach you in the hotel you're in somewhere else. And it's the detectives and they're like, hey, we want to talk to you. And I'm like, I'm all the way in Odessa. How could I be in Breckenridge, Texas? doing that crime and they're like, okay, they left, they left it alone. I eventually the FBI and all kinds of people uh, were sitting, uh, it, it was crazy, man. You know the car you see on the side of the road that's for sale? Okay, that car that was there for like two weeks wound up in the front of that house that I was in and that was the FBI and I was thinking, <laughs> I'm like, wow, it was funny. If there was a hot dog guy vendor for two months there, that guy pulled out a badge. You know, everybody had a badge. I was like, wow. I, I was going, they kicked down the door, you know. It was right before I went to, like, purchase uh, a lot of drugs. And it was right before it. So, I don't know, God's grace and mercy, because I would have probably still been in jail. So, I only had a few grams. So, I got charged with over 250, uh, under 250 grams, over four. And uh, I wind up going to jail for facing 25 years for an aggravated robbery I did not commit. But you know what that did to me? It dropped me to my knees and it made me think of all these other things that God was talking to me. Eventually God would send a guy who says he's a pastor and I'm like, a pastor? I'm like, whatever. I don't even know what a pastor is. I only knew a priest and I thought that guy was just bald with a collar. I never understood it. I never understood that we were a royal priesthood and that that was an identity that we have, the Bible says, and that Priests back in the day gave people an encounter with God. They created tents so that you can have an encounter. And us being of a royal priesthood, that means that we are the walking, living tents that give people an encounter. But I did not know that. Oh, I knew that. This guy said he was a pastor and he's in jail and he's guilty and he is tripping out. And so wow. what's happening is that this guy literally tells me to read my Bible. He tells me to read it like the Snickers. Oh, because, yeah, because I read it and I came out and it, and it kind of grabbed me like Beetlejuice. It pulled my face into the Bible. And now all of a sudden I'm like excited and I run out. And I'm like, I read the Bible. He's like, you got to read it like you're eating the Snickers. You got to chew, like chewing the cup. He said, he said, when you get your first Snickers in prison, you know, your first store. Now, uh, most people don't know that because out here they just bite it, eat it and keep moving. Right. It's, it's satisfied in there. You don't do that. You pull out that snicker and you lay on your bed and you take one bite. And then you pretend like you're not going to eat the rest of it, even though later you go for another bite. You go, I'm not I'm going to save this. And you put it to the side and you're chewing and you taste every layer of that Snickers, whether it's the peanuts, the caramel. I mean, the chocolate. You're just like, mm -hmm. and I believe that that's uh, he's telling me. So I wind up learning that that's how we're supposed to read the word. We read it like it's just some book, but the reality is you can read less and get more than trying to read a bunch and not really meditate and chew and, and allow it to, to you to become one and see the truth, which is God's viewpoint, uh, and let that uh, face your lie. 
Yeah. Those were my events and that's how I got saved. I kneeled down in a prison cell and I began to, um, you know, I began to like, I, I didn't know repentance and all that, but I began to cry, cry, cry. And God, I'm sorry for selling drugs. God, I'm sorry for hurting women. God, I'm sorry for being a cheater and a liar. And I, I don't know. I think I went in for like an hour of like literally kneeling on the floor, uh, arms raised, right? I did not know surrender. You know how you're like, hey, raise your hands so you surrender. Okay. I did all that without knowing any of that. Yeah. I kind of was like, I'm so sorry. You know, I just started <laughs> crying and crying and, and just confessing and repenting. And I believe that was the moment where I began to turn around and really like, it's crazy because the Bible does work, you know? So that's how I got saved. Wow. Wow. That is so good. Thanks. So you feel like that was your is that the place that you felt like you hit rock bottom? Mm. Um, you know, I, I believe, like, yeah, yeah but I, I think it's just, you know, because I think there's a lot of things that people say like, hey, have you hit rock bottom? They hit, And um, sometimes I think it's uh, rock bottom is a series of events too, I believe. Like, I believe like every little thing makes up a whole, you know, and uh, I think like I truly, yeah, it was probably a moment. I guess the facing the 25 years was the, the icing on the rock bottom of that, you know, because obviously you hit rock, you know, I've hit so many rock bottoms because I've lost everything so many times and those were rock bottoms, but I did not know uh, what to look at or what to see. Oh, my bride is watching on Facebook. I didn't even know. She's doing her hair. Hey, baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, big shout out to all the people that are watching, man. Hi, Ruthie. And so, uh, Megan, he'll, 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 a lot of people, you should get Megan on your show one day. She does strip club ministry, incredible uh, ministry. But anyway, let me keep going. So, yeah, I feel like my rock bottom was I was facing 25 years. And I, for the, you know, I had a plan. I was going to run in the courtroom and grab the gun of the guy who was at the courtroom. And I was not going to do 25 years because I was just like, I can't do no 25 years. And uh, God had another plan, though. So that's, that's kind of, yeah, that was my thing. I feel like, I feel like every single storm or every single thing we go through, because uh, sometimes we want to think rock bottom is losing it all. Rock bottom could be the moment you run out of money one day or run out of it, it's it's where it's where you allow God to speak the truth to your lie. We call that deliverance. I think you know sometimes we think it's all the shaking and all that, and that's awesome. But when God's truth meets your lie, He is able to walk you out of that yeah. which you're in that's being delivered. You know. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome, Juan. So who is the one person that you could say, I'm sure you had many uh, people that have impacted your life, but is there one in particular that you can share with us? Wow, that's a lo that question right there is so hard. Yeah, I know. Who's like the biggest one? Because I know you've had a lot of people come run alongside of you. Um, I know God just opened the door to you for that, but is there one that you particular particularly can share. Wow. Let me, let me tell you something. That is wild. Because when, if I think from like John Ramirez being my older brother or Greg Lucas or any of these people that have came alongside me, I would have to say in the beginning, it was very lonely when it came to people. So like this right here, Jesus, yeah. the person in the Holy yeah. Spirit walked me. Even in the beginning of us planning a church, I didn't have no planting guide. I didn't have no, I did everything like, okay, Holy Spirit is telling me to do this. But I would say back then would be two people. Number one would be Miss Vinny. She was an, Miss Vinny and Billy. They were this older people that just always said, when I said, hey, aren't you going to go uh, see, let's say it was a big name guy. Aren't you going to go see the is over here or Jesse the Planets or whoever, you know? And she would be like, why? I'm with Juan Martinez. <laughs> and it made me feel like a million dollars. And she always believed in me. And this one, oh, I'm going to cry. Mm. My wife. Because I feel like, um, I feel like, you got to think, I came out with nothing. I had a bad haircut, bad clothes, bad everything. I had nothing. Um, just the word. And... Man looks at outward appearance. So I know even though she loves me, I know she was probably looking at me like sometimes like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Sometimes I'm like, why did this? And she always believed in me and she always encouraged me. And she always, if I said, you know, I really feel like God's telling us to do this. 
it didn't matter how crazy I looked and how much I didn't have, she literally um, would follow. Wow. And, um, so you would think, preacher, no, like, I, I got so much from the Holy Spirit, but I needed a Ruthie and a helpmate uh, to really believe in me. Um, and uh, that, to me, is greater than having any other preacher on my side. Now, I have had some great friends along the way, like John, you know, I always call him the older brother and, uh, you know, uh, Caleb Ring, you know, Robert Morris, his son, James Morris, you know, like there's all these people, uh, David Vestal, that God has brought in my life that are wise counsel and really help. But I think the top two people, uh, you know, would be Billy and Vinny, who really you wouldn't see as really? Like, yeah, because they just continue to edify and build, edify and build. And my wife, my wife, Ruthie, you know it's her birthday tomorrow, but anyway, birthday, Ruthie. Uh, she just always walked with me. And, you know, I, we joke around because my wife was kind of stubborn in the beginning, and I had more years in Christ than she did. And so I kept washing her in the word, and I go, babe, you're like my greatest disciple. And sometimes <laughs> you helped me because even though we've bumped heads, when I go, when we sit and I talk to her about the Bible, what it says, she just receives and she's just been awesome. And so, um, yeah, that's, that'd be it. Like, you know, you would think I've met so many people. I've been in rooms with like TD Jakes, like, and I'm not saying all those teachers and ministers and people have helped, but the most powerful people in my life were the two I mentioned and, and definitely my bride. Uh, wow. I, I say Vinny and Billy first because you know, sometimes you just need somebody to believe in you yeah. um, and, and walk it out with you when you yeah. have nothing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I kind of, Ruthie was my friend then. And so that's why I say she, they, they played a vital role in the beginning. Uh, they always made me feel like I was somebody and uh, it may, it matched with what God was saying to me. And so I continued to walk it out. And that's so, yeah, awesome. There's that, that is- for the big cry. I went from gangster to cry, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome. That's, that is so incredible. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yes. That. Ruthie, you are so amazing. Yes, we got a chance to meet you and you're just an amazing, amazing woman. Yes. So can you share with us a divine moment when the Lord uh, turned your head and you never looked back? Wow. It it was after the cell. Like I I had an encounter with, I, I don't know, like if you, if the, something came from the heavens at the speed of light and hit you, and you know how fast the speed of light is, it's like, I, I forgot, I used to know it in, 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 you know, it was like 150 something miles per second or something. And it hit you, it knocked you to an, you know, if a car hits you, it knocked you across the street. But if something coming at the speed of light hits you, that was light, it would knock you into another atmosphere. And for me, I felt like, I feel like that moment was just, I, I never looked back. Like I got saved and I, 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 I don't know. I've just never looked back. It's just, that was my defining moment. I've been running since and walking this out since then. I, I have never looked back. I, I haven't, you know, felt in a pornography, any of those things, you know, lust or drugs or drank again or I just kind of been going since it, I just believe. And of course, I mean, the word, you have to believe in the word. You have to truly believe. Um, and you have to, you know, sometimes people talk about, um, you know, I'm actually talking this week about true belief systems and false belief systems. And uh, I mentioned it a little bit in the book about projected lies, survival lies. And I feel like the truth sets you free, but you have to identify the lie. Because a lot of times we've picked up lies that have been developed for so long that we don't look at anymore and we forget because we think we're Christians, there's no change. You know, there's there, renewing the mind. You would have to identify some of the things that are false uh, that you've picked up. And sometimes that's the hard part because you've developed it for so many years that uh, you forget and you think the truth that you embrace is the reality that you live, even if it's a lie. So you have to match that with God's viewpoint. Yeah. We have the cross. It's the cross is the exchange. So there's truth, God's viewpoint, and there's the things that you've picked up to know as true because maybe they were told to you by a person of authority or a mom and dad, and they didn't mean 
harm, but they didn't give you God's viewpoint. And you developed that, and then you became that. That's why he said you have to be born again, because you have to unlearn and relearn yeah. mm -hmm. for the rest of our lives. We yeah. think, oh, well, I got older, I've got it off. No, there's things that you, blind spot, little things that, oh, well, why am I upset like that? Or why do I act like that? You know, and, it, and you continue to work and God continues to weave this tapestry. Oh, it's beautiful. Yes, it is. He has definitely woven a beautiful one in your life for sure. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. Um, so share with us the point where you were called to preach. Like how did you, because you said that, you know, you didn't really have any mentors and, you know, you just kind of, God spoke to you, which I, I love that. I love walking by faith and hearing from the spirit and just yeah, yeah. moving. And yeah, so can yeah. you share a little bit about that with us? Oh yeah, Big John Maxwell. He played a, a vital role. I kind of, I'm on his, you know, I'm one of one of his teams, and he developed later. You know, he was one of the guys that kind of start kept developing my leadership. You know, but anyway, uh, what was the question again? How did I what? Oh, how, how did, did I you, preach? Yeah, yeah. How, when did you know that you were called to move into preaching? And yeah. yeah. So, so I didn't understand evangelism, pastoring, ministry, nothing. You got to really understand this. I just knew that what these guys did here was that they changed and they started telling everybody. So when I came out, Ruthie and this other person, Amber, they just always said, well, let's go back to this place. And that's how we wound up in Breckenridge going back. And they always challenged me on going back. So I went and I just met somebody and, you know, kept all I was really doing was I was telling people I once was blind and now I see, you know, <laughs> believe it i couldn't walk and now i'm walking you know i and i don't understand how people don't when they get saved but you know it could be gifts and stuff has to get developed and i understand all that uh and so i i just continued going and sharing and talking and 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 what winds up happening this is crazy because god will hide things in the insignificant places i need you to catch this because we're people who look at the outward appearance and we like big things and we like this and we like that. And we forget that when he did a miracle with sharing uh, the, the loaves and the fish, he hid it in an insignificant place. He hid it in a little brown paper bag in a little boy. Everybody might have been looking for restaurants and you know, <laughs> where can we get it from and what's wrong, God, and how are we going to do this? And he's like, it's in the insignificant places because we're selfish and prideful. Without the cross, he'll hide it in an insignificant place. And if you begin to look at the little things, you will find the mysteries of God. Mm -hmm. What ends up happening is he asked me and my wife, uh, they're having trouble in the live uh, Facebook. But um, here's the, the, the thing. He winds up telling me, uh, this guy asked me, hey, would you come in and uh you know help translate and so i did that and then one day he had an integrity issue with his spanish pastor and he asked me to do it and i was like what i was like ah, i can't do that i'm, I'm thinking I'm like no there's no way I'm, and at that moment i have learned because everybody going you're an evangelist you're an evangelist you're an evangelist so i'm like okay i'm an evangelist you know because <laughs> i guess i'm telling everybody about jesus and uh, but i'm thinking like i got saved so i'm telling everybody about jesus you know that's just normal everybody has the work of an evangelist but i kind of i'm an evangelist so this guy's like hey i need you to pastor the spanish church for me and he's like just for a while so i told my wife she's like oh heck no <laughs> she's like no way she's like i we I came to the American Jesus, even though I can speak Spanish well, I read my Bible in English, I sing all the English songs, so it was very difficult. My wife winds up praying and fasting, she comes and she's like, I think we're supposed to do it. And you know, the guy, I try to get out, I try to get out of it to be honest, and he was like, look, we don't want you because you're able, we want you because you're faithful. You can make a faithful man able, but you can't make an able man faithful. That's good. And so I go, okay, fine, so I do it. You know that me taking the thing I did not want to do, God broke it, I gave thanks, and it multiplied. Yeah. It then that I realized I had a pastoral heart and that I really wanted to help people. And it launched me into my destiny. Most of us look at the way things are packaged and we miss the blessing. Yeah. That's awesome, Juan. I love that. I love that. I, you know, I, 
I know we have so many more questions we'd like to talk about, but I wanted to make sure we get yes. time to talk about your book. Yes. I'm so excited. You guys, I'm just going to say this up front before we start talking about it. You've got to read it. It is so amazing. I love that. I and love so that. I just add, um, I want to know, how did uh, Beyond the Yellow Brick Road come about? But I wanted to make sure we get Get what? You got it. You got it. So okay. how did Beyond the Yellow Brick Road come about? Oh, man. So, you know, you know, it's crazy. You know, when me and John talk about it, people automatically go in the comments. They're like, oh, you guys, is this magic? And, and I'm like, no, you got to read the book. It's all biblical. Um, you know, it, it's, it's straight Bible. And really, God spoke to me. He speaks to me like in plays, movies, kind of weird. You know, I guess because I'm visionary and picture. So I, when I read, I see movies in my head. It's just the way I am. And uh, you know what? The cool part is that one day I was praying and God showed me. He said, Juan, as your heart begins to change, because that's the repository place. A lot of times we think it's backwards, like we speak, but what we don't really have in our heart. So that's why you wind up going in different directions. But it says that when you believe in your heart and confess in your mouth. So the heart plays a major role first. And then you begin confessing what's in your heart. And that's then when the tongue creates a rudder where you begin to walk out. Uh, the things of heaven and you see heavenly manifestations. But uh, he was like, Juan, he's like, Juan, as you release the things that I'm placing in your heart, um, you begin to, I begin to order your steps and it becomes a lamp onto your feet where you begin to see how to walk these steps out. And as the streets of gold are, as the heaven streets of uh, are gold, you'll begin to see yellow uh, gold bricks. And that would be like the light in the spiritual sense where you would walk out. And when you're in agreement, the living word and the word that you're reading becomes in agreement. Then you begin to walk these things out and you'll see heaven. So I'm like, wow. So I go start telling the church about it. And as I'm telling the church, it begins to come out. It's the same thing like our Hebekin thing. You know, it happened right at the pulpit at a minute where God's presence was there. It wasn't planned. It just started spurting out about Dorothy. And so I began to type and write stuff out because I truly believe there's so much revelation in that. You, you want to get into the revelation? You want to ask me the question? Yeah, no, go ahead and speak. You did talk about Dorothy's journey and the three characters that she encounters who desperately long for something. So share. Sure. Well, let me share something with you. I believe totally, totally, totally. God begins to talk to me about Dorothy as I begin to write it out and I go watch the movie again and I just start seeing all these spiritual things. I start to see Dorothy who's who's in this, uh, you know, everybody on, on EM and all that. Cause you really got to think when she goes over there, she get it's, it's, she's really dealing with herself. And I'll show you that here in a minute. And she's dealing with uh, a heart. She's dealing with one is looking for courage, right? If I only had a brain, she's dealing with the heart and she's dealing with courage. And I believe that all of these things are synonymous to the Bible. And so she is wanting to get away because they're like, you're not smart enough. And she's scared with the lady who's got Toto. And, you, you know, you just got to have more courage. So they're telling her all these things that later she's facing. Now, here's the problem. Like every Christian, what she says is she goes, I want to go somewhere far, far away. Somewhere where there's no trouble. And isn't that just like every Christian? We, we come to Jesus and it's like, God, you do it all. But please don't let me have any trouble. And I just want to get away from all this trouble. And so that's what she does. And she it takes a storm. Now, I think it's hilarious how it's a window because that's where you see out from. And in that, she begins to see everything, even the things she fears. The, I, when I was a kid, I saw the witch. <laughs> and it would get me so scared. You know, and she sees all this going through the window. She gets hit in the head. And I just saw that as the window where we see from. And usually the storm gives you an opportunity in your mind to either continue to stay in your patterns or respond to the word of God. And so she winds up going to this place. The house falls on the on the witch. She gets the ruby red slippers. Glenda, the good witch, shows up. And all of us, which I call the Holy Spirit, by the way. And uh she begins to tell her about this journey that she has to take. And instead of her uh, getting away from her trouble, she actually goes to a place where she has to face every single thing that she thought as troubled. And isn't that how God is? Yeah. I believe 
Every storm is an opportunity to get elevated. Every storm is an opportunity to be able to do exceedingly abundantly more than he could hope, think, or imagine. And all of this happen in the mind. And so that's kind of what happens. And it has the beginning and it has, you know, all of this great stuff. And so that's how I got inspired to write the book. And that's a little bit about the book. Wow. Well, I, I just loved all the characters that yeah. you talked about. And um, I know you, you shared a little bit about how she encounters them, but yeah. can you, can you talk a little bit about um, the three characters that she runs into the, the Tin Man, the Lion, and the Scarecrow. Absolutely. Um, you know, when she runs into each one of them, you have to understand that she's really, the amazing thing is she's running into it herself, right? So she has to, she, I feel like she had to get her heart right. And in our heart is our repository. That's where all of our thoughts sit. That's why it says the issues of life spring forth from our heart. That's why there's so many scriptures that talk about the heart. And I can get into more detail on kind of how the brain and the mind works and all of these things. Uh, but the reality is that that's where everything sits. And so from there, she she begins, she has to face, not only does she have to get a new home. If, remember at the end, let me, let me share some things with you that I think I'm going to try to do this because I know we're limited on time because we're getting close. Yeah. <laughs> She winds up getting the ruby red slippers, which I, which I believe give access uh, into Oz where he has all the answers to really get to a place where he just says, here's the certificate because you're already smart enough. Here, here's this because you already have courage. And doesn't God say that he's given us everything for divine purpose to give us a way of escape? So really that's all he's doing. The balloon leaves so no man-made way can get you to, the, to your destiny. Only the access or the shoes or the blood of Christ can give you access. If you look at Revelations 3.20, he is knocking at the door so that you can let him in. And here's the problem with America and everything today is that we, Jewish custom says that if she opens the door fully, he comes in and subs with you. In Jewish custom, what that means is that you get married. They come with the brothel, which is the cup of wine, and they come with a price paid. That's Jesus. And all of a sudden, we're just go opening the door. We're going, hey, Jesus, how you doing? I'll see you on Sunday. Or, hey, Jesus, how you doing? I'll see you when times get tough. But we don't want to let him in fully. And here, how does she destroy it? She goes with a bucket of water. She has to go get the broom of the authority. And what do we do? We give up our authority. But not Dorothy. Even though she's running around and she's scared, she grabs a bucket of water, which I think is representative of the word. She tosses it on the witch. And what happens? I'm melting, I'm melting. <laughs> grabs the broom. In order to get the answers, you have to face that thing that you're scared about because God is not giving you a spirit of fear. But that spirit of fear that he's not giving you is when you're resting in the knowledge of who he is and knowing that you have salvation. And that's when you can boldly grab that broom. You remember what happens? All the minions. I thought she was going to get beat up by the crew of the witch. That's not what happens. One steps forward and he says with this voice and he goes, thank you. You've set us all free. Why? Because when you overcome the thing that you know you should overcome, everybody else gets free. You start freeing people because of your praise and because of your testimony that you've overcome by the access of his blood. That You know, the word of the testimony, but I believe it's all in the shoes. She Remember, she, she had asked, give me the shoes. She never gave it to her. She never gave it to her. Some wow. of you are giving away the things that God has given to us and blessed us with. I need you to understand that today's the day. And that's that awesome. the book. Wow. Amen. So Amen. Good. That is so awesome. Now, yeah. your book, which is already out, it's um, available on Amazon, correct? Yep. yep. Can you share with our viewers, you have, um, you have an amazing thing that you're doing with your book to help um people in prison so can you share with our viewers about that absolutely you know i'm gonna give god the glory because i wouldn't have came up with a plan like this i probably would have been a little selfish but the reality is that god put in my heart and he was like Juan, do you really want to see the captives free you know if you look at the book i dedicated it to the people who are incarcerated but also to the ones who have built walls within themselves that are locked in, in, that need freedom. It doesn't matter what you're stuck from. This book will get you unstuck. So I said, yes, Lord, that's what I really want this book to do. He said, great. You're going to give one book away for every book that is sold. 
So we're, we, we're trying to fulfill the whole state of Texas prison. Some people tell me, once you're done with that, and I'm thinking, like, how are we going to reach 124,000? That's a lot. That's a lot, God. And so he's like, and so other people are like, we're going to keep going. And so we've, you know, 124,115 covers. I, I got to put the new number because we've covered already two prisons, Carol Vance and Polunsky unit. We, they've all gotten books. Uh, even the guys at death row, they even played one of the sermons that I got to preach about the book to them. So I thought it was awesome. All these guys are on death row listening to this. You know, I thought it was awesome. We've given books to three men's home and one woman's home uh, who are drug addicted. And then we're going to give to ha Heels to Halo. We're just, we just need people. This is the book that you buy. You get set free. You love it. It's a short read. So you get to just really eat of it. I think we're trying to come up with a, a leader, a small group book or so that people could walk out the yellow brick road. But um, it's a book that not only do you support and you, you actually get free, but somebody else gets free who would probably never buy the book, but they wind up getting in their hand and they get set free. That's the, there's the power. I, I thought, how am I going to make it to 124,000? God said, I have a lot of people. Yeah. There's the power of people. I don't have to be famous. I don't have to be famous. There's a lot of people out there who want to see people set free that are based on addictions or just set free in a bad marriage, in a bad, in a bad whatever, stuck. This will give you the answers to get you thinking on why you are the way you are. And it the keys to unlock the promises of God. Wow, that's awesome. I'm going to share with everybody. This is Juan Martinez's book, uh, Beyond the Yellow Brick Road. Is it, It's an amazing book. And like he said, it's a short read. Um, so for those of you who don't like reading or your attention span is small, you are not, um, you, I believe you can read this in one sitting. It will totally uh, hold you captive. And, um, and you know, when you buy the book and uh, you read it, um, pay it forward, you know, and like one said, for every book that you buy, one will go to a prisoner, which I just think is, Amazing. And I know so many prisoners are going to benefit from your amazing new book. Well, I sure do. Love, I love I have my copy and I have a lot of a lot of things underlined. There's so much revelation in this book. And I, I just want to shout out to people and say, don't miss Go out and get this book. And not only does it like he said, it helps you, but um it, it gets it into the hands of prisoners. And let me just say, um, my husband and I do prison ministry. And right now, they have been in lockdown, a lot of them. And they need, they need this. They need this in their hands. They are hungry for the word. They are hungry to hear. And so, please go out and buy this book yes. and and know what you're doing you're blessing someone's life you're opening up the, this truth to them for them to be set yeah. free well and i just want to add so many people um that i run across this is my heart is for people to be in the word yeah and yeah. Um, because i don't believe that people don't read the bible because they don't want to or they don't want a relationship with the lord so many people out there don't read the Bible because they don't comprehend it. They don't have that movie that you're talking about, that comprehension. Yeah, and they yeah. get um, they they don't understand it. And so they get discouraged and they just don't say in the word. So if you haven't read the Bible, yeah, read this yeah. book, because this book will be like a jump start, kind of an overview that you will be mm -hmm. able to relate to because. We all love Wizard of Oz. I oh, knew, yeah. I look forward to Wizard of Oz every year because we knew when we were little that when the Wizard of Oz came on, it came on the same time every year in the fall. Next was Rudolph and then Frosty and Christmas and Santa Claus was coming. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. We, we looked for the Wizard of Oz. So if you haven't read the Bible, get this book. Let yes. this book speak to your yes. heart because one has so many great kingdom principles he does. in this book that um, you can glean from. And then, you know, just pray that God takes that and gives you a heart to beat his word. Because one's right. The Bible is a, a living word. And yeah. every time you can read the same scriptures over and over again. And God will speak a word to you through his, through his book. So thank you, Juan, so much for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 thank you so much for having me on the. Sports talk. 
Yes, yes, yes. We thank you so much yep. for yep. being on here today. Thank you so much. If I, I know we got, we got uh, maybe like a minute or two, but um, you know, the Lord gave me a word for 2021, and uh, because I know that was one of your questions there, so I'm just going to jump in it. But it gave me a word for 2021. I, I would challenge everybody to read uh, Psalms 34, one through nine, and uh, eight and nine. You know, one through seven. He's kind of just telling you how good God is in his goodness. But then he tells us to taste and see for ourselves, to experience God for ourselves. The Lord gave me a word, and it's the Lord is good. And if you would think um, to get into the promised land, uh, not everybody made it in there. And out of the 12 spies, uh, it was actually there. If you look at Deuteronomy 1, I think 22, Moses is actually talking to them 40 years later and telling them, look, it was your idea. You asked me for a route. I gave you the route. So think about that. The minute they went in there, they saw the giants and talked themselves out of something that they came up with the decision. That's crazy to me. Yeah. I believe that in in 2021, we really have to get to a place where we know, like we know that the Lord is good mm -hmm. and, and see for ourselves. In 19, uh, he gives you a cushion or nine, he gives a cushion. And this is what it says. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him? You who are his holy ones, fear the Lord. This is nine. So he's after he gives you one to seven, all the great things, he gives you the taste and see. And then nine, he says, uh, you who are his holy ones, fear the Lord or have reverence or respect for the Lord. Respect what he says, right? For those who fear him will lack nothing. That means that those who don't will lack everything. So that's my word for 2021. Make sure, not just say it, but make sure you taste and see that the Lord is good. That's a good that word, Juan. Thank so you good. so much for sharing that today. Yes. So we uh, would love for you to end uh, in prayer today. Awesome. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Porch Talk. I thank you so much for Kim and Danielle, who just are so excited about uh, the things of heaven. Heavenly Father, may, may this show go everywhere and reach many and touch hearts save lives, deliver people, but also put them on a journey uh, that they will experience uh, all that David is saying in Psalms 34. May mm -hmm. 2021 be the year where we would declare that the Lord is good yes. because those who know that the Lord is good will always step into the promised land, even if there's giants in the land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Juan. We love you guys. And real quick, will you please tell everybody where your um, church is? You have two locations. Oh, absolutely. You can catch us. I'm going to put a little link here, but you can go. Um, we have one on the Springside North Campus uh, that's on Alden Westfield. It's called Get Wrapped, G-E-T-W-R-A-P-P-E-D, Church, Get Wrapped Church in Spring, Texas. We also have one on the southeast side in case you live on the other side of Houston. Um, but you could also watch all our stuff live on Sundays at the Get Rap Church page or YouTube channel. Or we have a free app called Get Rap TV. And so there it is. Thank you. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, before, we're going to let you go before we give our final announcements. We know you're very busy what you're doing. We thank you so much for being on here today. Thanks. Thank you so all much. Right. It was an honor to be with you guys. Thank you. Yes. Give Ruthie our love and bless you guys. You guys have a great weekend. Love y'all. Love you too. Bye-bye. Wow. Isn't that, wasn't he amazing? Oh, man. I tell you, I don't know about y'all, but I got excited for the zeal. I know. He has so much. I mean, he just pulls you in who could not get excited by li just listening to Juan? i mean and if you have a depressed day replay this video yeah. <laughs> just hit play because i mean you can definitely get encouraged to, you yeah. can just he's been saved for quite a while now and doing what he's been doing and you can still feel his passion and his and you know i believe that comes from staying in his word we're just called to feed on the word to give us um uh, encouragement every day from the Lord to fill our minds up with his word. So that way we don't live in fear and anxiety.
So um, we're excited. We thank you guys that you tuned in today uh, to see Juan Martinez. And um, we are uh, next week, I believe you and I are on. Yes. Yes, next week. Yes. So we just want to know if you are listening out there and you have a ministry that you would like um, highlighted on the Porch Talk, we would love for you to email us at porchtalk at yahoo.com. And also, um, each week we will feature a different porch. So Kim and I, we could be sitting on your front porch. So if you have a porch you would like to share with us, maybe one that's, um, I don't know, we had one uh, from ba uh, Brad from God's Garage. He had a fire pit yeah, that was really that cool was over the holidays. So if you have a porch that you would like us to sit on during our live broadcast, you can also email that photo to porchtalk at yahoo.com. And I also, if you like this video, if it has blessed you, then I, I ask that you sh like and share the um, YouTube channel, War Room on Wheels, like and share this broadcast um, to encourage and edify other people and share Juan Martinez and his book. And also um, War Room on Wheels is doing a 30, 30, 30 day challenge. Uh, with COVID, there's been so much COVID chaos ever since COVID hit last March. And um, like me, I'm sure there's many of you who have been hibernating at home, who've been eating our way uh, through the, the things on the media and the TV, and um, we're just consumed in fear and anxiety. And, um, you know, as a life coach and fitness trainer, um, the career that I used to have, that's still in me. And it's time to get up and it's time to rise and it's time to get aligned and, you know, to get out of that cycle of depression um, and in out of hibernation, we need to get out and we need to move and we need to be in God's word. So I have a 30, 30, 30 day challenge. It's called Get Aligned. And we're going to be the 30, 30 consists of 30 days of workouts, 30 days of um, fasting and 30 days of scriptures to get in God's word. So if you're interested, it begins January the 15th through February 15th. So there's still time to show up and um, you will have access to all of this information, clean eating recipes and um, principles of clean eating and um, menus and meal plans and things like that. And then you can um, you can be following uh, Kim and I that we work out two days a week together. So you probably will see us working out to get she doesn't know this yet, but <laughs> so we may be doing some live um, video broadcasting working out, but we're going to do this together. So sign up today. Go to warroomonwheels.com and email me and um, I will send you more information on that. She's always getting me into something without telling you. <laughs> um, I just want to say this about fasting. Yeah. Um, fasting doesn't always mean food. That's right. And when people hear fast, yeah, they, they just go, no, I can't do that. Yeah. Fasting can be anything. What is it that we take it before the Lord and we ask him, what is it that we need to give up? That's got a hold on. That's us. right. That's good. And so it, we have to, we have to be willing to lay it down. Yes. We can give anything up for thirty days. Yeah, it's not a big deal. And I tell you, in that thirty days, if you will do, if you will lay that down for thirty days, it will lose a hold on you. Yes, and it will. Once you lay that down, it will draw you into such a place with God that you will be so overtaken that you'll look back at th day 31 and go, do I even want to pick that yeah. back up again? So I, I just wanted to share that when she was saying that, that was just really bubbling up in my spirit to say, do not let that word fast freak you out. Yeah. Because it doesn't mean we have to, we grew, I know I grew up believing that fasting was you had to start. Yeah. No, no, that's not it. Ask God what it is that he wants you to fast. And this is a time, you know, every, every January yeah. we come before the Lord yeah. and we honor him and we ask, I do. I ask the Lord, what is it that I need to lay down? What is it that you want me to fast or how you want me to fast this year? Yeah. And he comes in and I'm telling you, when you do, it takes you into a different place. I'm sorry, I got I got all excited. Well, I'm glad she brought that up because that's exactly true. This fasting is not food. The whole 30 days, every day is a different thing 
that you're going to be required to give up to get back your to get your life back in balance and get aligned. So it's things like and maybe one day you give up sodas and one day you give up TV and one day you um, give up something that uh, chocolate or something. Every day is a different day. And it's all uh, I know sweets and chocolate had a hold over me, you know, and and Coke Zeros. I had, uh, there I said it. OK, I said it. <laughs> and so when we're drinking mostly things like that and they have a hold and there's no balance, then that's something we need to lay down. So every day is a different fast and it challenges you. You know, it, it's, it's called a 30 day challenge for a challenge. And so I'm challenging you to bring balance back into your life and get back in a line because I know through this COVID, we have left behind a lot of good habits and we have picked up a lot of bad habits. And this this month is the month to put that to a stop. So Kim brought up an awesome point and that's exactly what we're going to do in this challenge and this fasting. So yeah. I'm ready for it. And um, there's a private group created for those who want to join in. And you're going to see me in the raw working out right along with you guys. So um Email War Room on Wheels and Kim. Yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it, it'll be an adventure for sure. Look, we're human too. We're flesh too. And there's things we have to bring into alignment. Um, Kim and I share that all the time in our workouts. And I think we're, I think sometimes we're harder on ourselves. Well, than yes. And, I, and one thing I want to share, this came to my mind too, is there is a, um, a fast that um, happens every year by a group, a couple, um, Steve and Wendy Backlund, and it's called Negativity Fast. Mm, that's a good one. So one, I mean, one of the fasts that we need to make sure that we're doing daily, you know, this is, um, I was, uh, I was listening to a teaching, just breaking down what the year, we're in a decade, the decade of the mouth and the Jewish calendar, we're in the decade of the mouth. And it's so important. The Bible says the, that blessing and curses, life and death, come, we have that, that power of our tongue. Yes. It is so important that we watch what we say and what we speak. Yes. And so um, negativity is another thing where we can pass is that when we, we start listening to what comes out of our mouth, yeah. I know I have to because I can, I can all of a sudden, yes. something happen and I'll be like, you know, I start listening, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. And I start reeling it back in, I'm like, yeah. no, I, I don't want to do that. So that's that's just what fasting is. Yeah. And it doesn't, ha don't, you don't have to be afraid of it. No. It can be a very positive thing. Yeah, that's awesome. I like the negative. Well, the power of life and death is in the text, yeah. like you said. And, I, and sometimes we don't mean to say those things, but they're habits. They're bad habits. Mm -hmm. And like Kim was saying earlier, we need to, um, retrain our brain with positive pathways. And to do that, we got to learn to speak. So we speak um, positive things. I, I saw I have this thing up here. So, um, oh, I don't have it after all. I was going to show you. But anyways, we thank you guys for being on today. We love you guys. We thank you for your loyalty. And uh, we will see you next Friday live at 1030 on the Porch Talk. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.